lines without the Baroque's definition of the fantastic to your Dan Radichko's short story, January. Right, so, um, can you hear me well? Because I think uh, if I hold the microphone, it becomes productive. I've had so much coffee. So, um, <laughs> it was shaking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one? I was playing through there. I don't think it's fine. Okay. So, um, I'm doing the Inferno European Literature at Cambridge, and actually, I'm primarily focusing on German literature in the 19th century. But I was very lucky to be able to do uh, this topic in the first knowledge of critical theory uh, and to uh, actually use the Bulgarian text. Uh, so I'm going to talk about narrative, and uh, specifically about a narrative of Iran Lidichko's short story January. Um, and Iran Lidichko himself, um, he was born in 2004, he's a Bulgarian writer who was born in Kumanisi in the northwest of Bulgaria, and he's actually a Nobel Prize, only Bulgarian Nobel Prize for literature. Um, the short story January appeared for the first time in 1965 in the short story collection Fierce Mood. I kept all the original titles or quotations in the original as well. Uh, it, you probably might be aware of it as in its later adaptation for the stage from 1974, but this is what it first appeared in 1965. I'll give you a summary because I'm also talking about it if you don't know what happens, so spoiler alert. Um, so we have a group of villagers on a very, very cold January night in the tavern um, discussing what, ha what snow, uh, what chaos the snow has wrecked around the world. And um, all of a sudden, a sleigh pulled by widely named horses appears. And this is a sleigh of one of the fellow villagers went to town earlier that day. And it's the man is gone, and all that's left is his coat, uh, the rifle, and the shop wolf. And one man goes to investigate about what's happened, and the exact same thing happens to him. He comes back, uh, he doesn't come back, uh, and only a dead wolf, his coat, and his rifle come back. Uh, and that happens a few times, and then all of a sudden um, they decide uh, that a group is going to go. And until that point, we see absolutely nothing of what happens with the villagers that go and investigate. And then the narrator takes us um, with that group, and we discover, and this is a now, that um, what happens is in the field, the wolves surround the sleigh, one man kills the leader of the pack, and then they get off the sleigh, um, put the wolf in the sleigh, but stay stuck. So they push at it to, to unstuck it, and what the horses are so mad, so maddened by the uh, smell of the dead wolf, that once it's unstuck, they bolt and leave them there. And again, the narrator leaves them there, so we can get to have absolutely no idea what's going on. And we go back to the villagers, and all of the remaining villagers decide to leave and investigate as well. But with the exception of one, curiously, and this is what he says. Um, he told them that he would not because there would be no one to pull out the next wolf from the sleigh and measure it to see how many feet it was long. And then this is the final sentence of the whole story. The next wolf was seven feet long, so again, we don't see what happens, and the pattern has repeated itself, and this is how that is. And the way that this ties in with Todorov's uh, concept of the fantastic, so in 1970, Todorov published um, this book, which has been translated in, in, into English as The Fantastic, A Structural Approach to Literary Genre, in which he defines an event that happens in a narrative in a way that ruptures the narrative coherence. He defines um, that event as a strange event, and um, because it disrupts the narrative coherence, the reader must opt for one of two possible solutions to explain it. So either he is the victim of an illusion of the senses, of a product of the imagination, and the laws of the world then remain what they are, or else the event has indeed taken place and is an integral part of reality, but then this reality is controlled by laws unknown to us. And crucially, the fantastic is a moment. It only lasts while there is hesitation between these two options. In the moment that we decide which of the two it is, the reader decides, or the protagonist decides, then the fantastic is resolved, we have the either marvelous or the uncanny. And um, I've argued in um, this work that uh, in January, the fantastic is created through uh, various narrative devices, the way the narrative unfolds. So we have the wolves that assume very human characteristics as opposed to the humans who can't really organize themselves properly. Then we also have a very heavy use of modalization phrases. So we have, it, it appeared as if, so all phrases hesitation, the false hesitation throughout the text. Uh, we also have, again, this final sentence where we have the next wall for seven feet long. All of a sudden, the narrator, which is the third person, or who is the third person narrator, has suddenly receded. So it seems that this wall is measured by no one in particular. Um, so we also have, uh, again, this final 
this final position of the fantastic is completely unresolved. We have seen what has happened with those villages in the woods, um, in the field, but we have absolutely no idea what will happen after the story has ended because the pattern in the end has repeated itself. And um, this is particularly important because in this way, the fantastic is pushed outside the boundaries of literature, outside the boundaries of the text, in a way that forces the reader to engage with the fantastic. And we have um, Paul Trabert, who says <coughs> that narrative is a principal way in which a species organizes in the setting of time. And Todorov himself actually says in the book that um, the fantastic actually uses this convention, the convention very well because text is linear, we read it in a linear manner. And this is actually something that a lot of critics have engaged later with Todorov's theory that um, this is not necessarily true. We can't know that the reality, the supposed reality that's ruptured in the text through the fantastic is actually real. Um, so the reader will be aware that time, after the narrative is run out, time measured by mechanical clocks or the, the phases of the sun or the moon, what have you, time will continue. And the reader still doesn't know what happens after that time has continued. So in this way, um, the fantastic is completely thrown into this realm of the outside literature, that is, outside the grasp of the reader who is completely unguided by anything anymore. No, 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 no narrative, no text. And I wanted originally to talk about um, the fact that um, the fantastic, but open-endedness in literature generally, has been used in many uh, word, lit literary works in um, repressive political systems uh, because of the ambiguity, because of the possibility to uh, be evasive. Uh, however, I decided to talk, to focus on something different, to talk about why the Rodishko himself is a very unusual and very unique storyteller, especially for Bulgaria. Um, his works are not just full of imagination, they are literally dripping with it. They, the imagination completely transcends the narrative bounds, and um, it forces you to, as a reader to, it challenges you to engage with it and through this contagious power of creativity and imagination. And um, we have, uh, this is a quote from Marina Warner's um, latest book, Once Upon a Time, A Short History of Fairy Tale. And she says that every listener is potentially a new storyteller, and it's about the oral transmission of fairy tales. Um, and the fairy, fairy tales and the fantastic actually have a very uh, different relationship than um, this academic study. But I want to draw a parallel here between this contagious power of stories and this um, possibility to, um, of a narrative to engage the reader in such a way that they communicate with the world that surrounds them and see, not just discover, not just the beauty of the world as it is, but also seek a way to implement change. And I will leave you to create and interpret for yourself what I mean by change. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank Lydia for uh, a truly fascinating presentation. Uh, any questions? So, what's your take on the ending? On the ending? My take? Um, well, I don't have a solution because I like ambiguity. <laughs> and I think um, that's, uh, for, for me personally, those are the best kind of narratives, the ones you can't make up your mind for, and they can change from one year to the next. So, at the moment, I'm going to decide maybe next year will be different, and then 10 years will be completely different. So, I don't know. Well, perhaps I, I could ask a question. Uh, one of the things I've always wondered about the digital uh, is to what extent was his creativity theoretically informed, or to what extent was it simply, if you like, uh, a uh, natural, spontaneous product of his wild imagination? I think, um, I'm not exactly sure about the literary influences. I did read a, 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 an article recently by Spencer Eagle that, that, that uh, explained that there was actually an article back in the 70s, I think, where he uh, specifically outlines his literary influences, but I'm not not too sure. But I do know that a lot of it came from um, well, the mythology of the Northwest. I think we put it that way. I think it's a it's sort of an oral tradition that gets transmitted there of different stories and different ways of thinking, different ways of talking as well. And he managed to use that. We think about the short story collection, but look, I think that's completely an influence of anyone else, really. And I think it's on par with the works of um, magical realists. Well, perhaps one more question. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that there was some connection uh, between uh, the, the fantastic and um, 
the political environment in which Hitchcock was uh, uh, writing. Uh, could you perhaps indicate, using this story as an example, of how this connection might work? Um, I think it's the, the general idea of ambiguity, the general idea of having an open ending, which uh, again is this combination of acknowledging the conditions as they are and uh, giving some indication that there could be change. I think open ending is in this way, the, the not lauding the regime as it is and um, uh, postponing it into the future, postponing something, whatever it is, into the future is potentially subversive in that way. Because I've worked socially, socialist realism was a particularly um, influential strand of the time, and he, by not write, writing directly in social, socialist realism, then he was in my challenging and subversive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay, I wanted to ask something in those lines. Actually, you reminded me. Do you think that uh, his uh, works were a bit different because he left in the time of the communism, and they would have been like different if he was in Bulgaria, for example? That's really hard. It's really, it's really good question, but it's really hard to answer because that means we have to subtract some from history and then put them into like a this vacuum of place that, that's not, not that historical. But um, I think that um, potentially, and potentially maybe he would have evolved even better because, um, but that's again, that's really hard to answer because if you think about Marcus, for instance, then he would be not, he wouldn't be the same person if he was writing a different time. But that's also very reductive because I'd say that because they were living in a su suppressive environment that made them good, good writers. So it's a really it's hard to strike the balance between those two um, the, the questions. So, I think in general, topic is ambiguity. Any final questions? Okay. If not, let me thank Lily for her very open and interesting.